As the Allies stormed the beaches of Normandy in 1944, a lesser-known yet equally pivotal campaign unfolded on the shores of Saipan, on the other side of the world. US forces were pouring everything they had into capturing the tiny island of Saipan, part of the Mariana Islands. The conquest of this island was as crucial as the liberation of France. Once America controlled the Marianas and their airfields, the US would finally be within range to dispatch B-29 bombers straight into the heart of Japan, a strategic move imperative for ending the war. The Japanese understood the stakes. Saipan was more than just another captured island. It was part of their homeland, and they were prepared to defend it to their last breath. American servicemen were bracing for one of the most brutal and grueling campaigns of World War II, determined to wrest the island from the grasp of the Empire of the Rising Sun. The spirit coursing through the American fighters was ready to propel them beyond what was thought possible. Sergeant Thomas Alexander Baker, a young soldier from the 105th Infantry Regiment, was among them. Severely wounded after American forces repelled a 5,000-strong Japanese counter-attack, Baker faced a dire situation. As his comrades struggled to evacuate him during a desperate retreat, he made an unthinkable request to be left behind. Unwilling to endanger others for his own life, he chose to confront his fate in a heroic last stand, buying time for his friends to escape. But there was one problem. He only had eight bullets left in his gun. The Pacific Theater's island-hopping campaigns in World War II were a gruesome ordeal, eclipsing the challenges faced by American forces on the Western Front. The brutality encountered in the Pacific was paralleled only by the savagery of the Eastern Front, where Germans and Soviets engaged in a relentless struggle, fiercely contesting every inch of land. While the Germans grappled with the bitter cold of Russia's vast landscapes in the early years of the war, the US Army and Marine Corps endured the stifling heat of the Pacific's tropical jungles for four arduous years. The oppressive climate, torrential rains, and menacing wildlife of the Pacific Islands posed a daunting threat to the health and well-being of the American soldiers, presenting a battle against nature as daunting as the fight against the enemy. The United States Marines were pitted against the tenacious and unwavering Japanese warriors, fiercely loyal to Emperor Hirohito. Educated in the ancient samurai tradition of Bushido, the Imperial Japanese Army's soldiers, sailors and marines were indoctrinated with a resolve to never surrender, even in the face of overwhelming odds and certain death. Japan had been growing into a powerful military force since the 1920s, aspiring to become the dominant power in the Pacific. Before World War II, the Empire of the Rising Sun had established its might through brutal campaigns across Asia in the late 1930s, the 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor, following the US oil embargo, caught the American armed forces at a disadvantage, lacking sufficient manpower and firepower for immediate retaliation. However, this dynamic would rapidly shift. The tide began to turn with the American victory in the pivotal Battle of Midway in 1942, a moment many historians regard as the turning point in the Pacific theater. This victory was a stark wake-up call to the Imperial Japanese Navy, which had gravely underestimated their American adversary. The US forces, determined to push Japan to surrender, realized that the path to the Japanese heartland lay through eliminating fortified Japanese garrisons spread across the Pacific Islands. As the American troops advanced closer to mainland Japan, they encountered increasingly fierce resistance. Japanese soldiers, steeped in a culture of unyielding bravery, were prepared to fight to their last breath rather than surrender. This resolve manifested in desperate Banzai charges and catastrophic kamikaze attacks aimed at inflicting maximum damage on the enemy. Yet the young Americans adapted swiftly, responding with equal ferocity. They conquered island after island with remarkable bravery, overcoming Wake Island, Guadalcanal, Tarawa and more. As they approached the sacred Japanese home islands, the strategic importance of Saipan and the Marianas became apparent. Their proximity to Japan made them vital staging grounds for the planned invasion of Japan. For the Japanese, who considered Saipan part of their homeland, the stakes were higher than ever. Their defense became increasingly desperate and fierce, setting the stage for one of the most intense and harrowing battles of the Asian conflict. The narrative of Saipan occupies a profoundly significant and emotionally charged chapter in Japan's history, particularly during its expansionist phase and the ensuing turmoil of World War II. 
Saipan's relevance to Japan transcended the usual strategic military importance often associated with territories seized in wartime. It was deeply rooted in the nation's history, culture, and imperial ambitions. Saipan's connection with Japan began well before the cataclysm of World War II. Following World War I, the League of Nations assigned Japan the mandate over former German territories in the Pacific, including the Mariana Islands, with Saipan among them. This mandate, awarded for Japan's support of the Allies and as a punitive measure against Germany, marked the onset of Japanese governance over Saipan. This reign spanned three decades, from 1914 until 1944. During this period, Saipan transformed from a distant outpost into an integral part of Japan's Pacific Dominion. In stark contrast to other islands that served as mere strategic military bases, Saipan was envisioned and nurtured as an extension of the Japanese mainland. This view was fostered through a systematic policy of cultural assimilation and settlement. The Japanese government actively promoted migration to Saipan. Japanese families relocated there not randomly, but as part of a structured campaign. The government's support took various forms, including subsidies and assistance in agriculture and commerce, encouraging families and entrepreneurs to settle. This influx of settlers led to the establishment of a community mirroring that of Japan, replete with educational institutions, Shinto shrines and businesses. The island's infrastructure and economic landscape were meticulously developed, further integrating it with Japan. This deliberate settlement and development were components of Japan's broader Nanshinron policy, an agenda focused on southern expansion. Saipan, with its fertile lands and pivotal location, perfectly aligned with this strategy. The island's burgeoning sugar plantations underscored the economic success of Japan's southern expansion. However, Saipan's significance for Japan extended beyond mere economic and strategic considerations. For many Japanese citizens, the island symbolized the realization of their nation's imperial aspirations and a concrete example of their empire's geographical reach. It stood as a beacon of national pride, a distant territory seamlessly woven into the Japanese national fabric. With the onset of World War II, Saipan's role shifted towards a more militaristic focus. Yet, its identity as part of the Japanese homeland persisted. Defending Saipan was not just a military objective, it was a matter of profound national honor, reflecting the deep emotional and cultural ties that had been nurtured over the decades. From this perspective, the Japanese military, recognizing the strategic importance of Saipan and anticipating an imminent Allied attack, deployed an array of defensive mechanisms across the island. These defenses were meticulously designed and strategically positioned to fortify the island against invasion. The defensive installations included a network of bunkers, pillboxes, artillery positions and trenches. These fortifications were strategically dispersed, particularly along the western and southern beaches, where the Japanese anticipated an amphibious assault by Allied forces. Leveraging the natural landscape to their advantage, the Japanese reinforced the rugged cliffs and dense jungles, transforming the terrain into threatening natural defenses. Mount Tapachau, Saipan's highest point, was fortified into a stronghold. This elevation gave the Japanese a commanding view of the island and its surrounding waters, a critical vantage point for monitoring and responding to enemy movements. Approximately 30,000 Japanese troops were stationed on Saipan, consisting of elements from the 43rd Division, the 47th Independent Mixed Brigade, and various smaller units. The force was under the command of Lieutenant General Yoshitsugu Saito, a seasoned leader who was acutely aware of the dire circumstances. The composition of the Japanese forces on Saipan was diverse, including regular army soldiers, naval troops and construction units. Additionally, a significant number of Korean laborers and local Camoro and Carolinian residents were conscripted to aid in defense efforts. The mindset of the Japanese troops was heavily influenced by the Bushido Code of Honor, conditioning them to fight to the last man. This indoctrination instilled a belief that falling in battle was far more honorable than surrendering, fueling their relentless resistance during the ensuing battle. To bolster morale, the Japanese military leadership undertook intensive propaganda campaigns. These efforts emphasized the critical role of Saipan as a defensive barrier against American advances and portrayed the impending battle as a crucial stand to protect the Japanese homeland.
In terms of physical preparedness, the Japanese troops underwent rigorous training to adapt to the challenging conditions of jungle warfare. They honed skills in night fighting and ambush tactics, anticipating the likelihood of close quarters combat within Saipan's dense foliage. Despite logistical challenges by 1944, the Japanese endeavored to stockpile essential supplies. Efforts were made to provide their troops with ample ammunition, food and medical provisions, preparing for a prolonged and grueling battle. For the Allied forces, particularly the United States, the Mariana Islands were indispensable in their strategy against Japan, and Saipan was their focal point. The Mariana's primary advantage was their proximity to the Japanese mainland. This geographical feature transformed them into potential launch pads for Allied attacks. The proximity was crucial, because other Pacific bases were too distant for most Allied aircraft to strike Japan and return without refueling, which was logistically unfeasible at the time. Controlling the Marianas meant dominating air and sea routes to Japan's inner South Seas Empire, thereby facilitating strikes on Palau, the Philippines, Formosa or China. Moreover, the Army Air Corps aimed to secure these strategic islands to establish air bases for their advanced long-range bomber, the B-29 Super Fortress. From the Marianas, these state-of-the-art bombers could easily reach and strike the Japanese home islands. The overarching goal was to initiate a sustained strategic bombing campaign against Japan. The B-29 Super Fortress, with its exceptional range and payload capacity, was the chosen weapon for this task. Operating from the Marianas, these bombers had the potential to penetrate deep into Japanese territory, targeting key cities and industrial centers. Urban centers like Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka and Kobe, once beyond the reach of Allied bombers, were now exposed to the destructive might of these aerial behemoths. The significance of the Marianas, and particularly the B-29 bombing raids, was pivotal in the comprehensive strategy to conclude the war with Japan. These new bombers marked a new era in warfare, where the capacity to strike from great distances could decisively alter the course of the conflict. However, the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean made direct bombing of mainland Japan impractical until the Marianas were within Allied control. Conquering the Mariana Islands meant that, for the first time in the war, Japan would be within range for a sustained bombing campaign. The US strategy aimed to relentlessly hammer military and civilian targets to erode the entire populace's resolve to continue the fight. The destructive power of the B-29 was a grim yet necessary alternative to a full-scale invasion of the Japanese mainland. Such an invasion was anticipated to result in a staggering number of casualties for both sides. Thus, the strategic bombing campaign, despite its projected brutality, was seen as a lesser evil. The United States finally launched its offensive on the Marianas with the understanding that if the Japanese combined fleet attempted to support their land garrisons, it would be met with the imposing might of the US Navy. Admiral Raymond Spruance commanded this immense naval force at the helm of the 5th Fleet, a colossal assembly of no less than 800 ships. This fleet included the mighty Task Force 58, boasting 12 fast aircraft carriers deploying 800 aircraft. This air power was bolstered by the support of eight battleships and a fleet of 80 other warships. Spruance's fleet was not only a naval juggernaut, but also a crucial transport mechanism for ground forces, carrying an impressive contingent of 80,000 marines and nearly 50,000 soldiers for a massive amphibious landing operation. The ground forces, known as the Expeditionary Troops, comprised an unparalleled assembly of three marine divisions, a reinforced marine brigade and two army infantry divisions, these troops were strategically organized into northern and southern troops and landing forces, each designated for specific assaults on the islands of Saipan, Tinian and Guam. Despite their apparent numerical superiority, US intelligence had underestimated the strength of the Japanese forces stationed on Saipan, pegging them at 19,000 men. The actual number of Japanese defenders in the archipelago was around 60,000, with approximately half of these forces on Saipan. Most of these troops were from the army under the command of General Yoshitsugu Saito. The remainder were naval forces led by Admiral Nagumo. These troops were heavily entrenched around Tanapag Harbor, bolstered by strong artillery defenses, including 8-inch guns. 
Additionally, the area was equipped with three airfields, although these had been rendered inoperable by the aggressive air assaults conducted by fighters from Spruance's 5th Fleet. This scenario set the stage for what was to become a crucial and intense phase of the Pacific War, as the US forces prepared to engage in a major amphibious assault against a heavily fortified and significantly larger enemy force than initially anticipated. The Saipan landing represented an unprecedented challenge for the US Navy Marine Corps team in the Pacific War, as it was over a thousand miles from the nearest US base, making it the most remote and daunting target they had faced. On the early morning of June 15, 1944, the US initiated a bold move in the Pacific theater with a fleet of transport ships converging on the southwest shores of Saipan. The Navy was pushed to its logistical limits, supporting what was then the largest amphibious operation in the Pacific. As the clock struck 9 a.m., Operation Forage commenced. Over 8,000 US Marines aboard a fleet of 300 tracked landing vehicles made landfall on Saipan's west coast, accompanied by a barrage of artillery bombardment. However, the operation soon encountered significant challenges. Although pre-assault bombardments by battleships, destroyers and aircraft targeted crucial points, many gun emplacements scattered across Saipan remained operational. These fortifications quickly became ambush points for the advancing Allies. In the midst of the unfolding chaos and urgency, numerous Marines confronted direct threats as they advanced into enemy fire. They faced relentless machine gun fire and encountered hidden explosives. The explosions shattered trees and wreaked havoc on equipment and personnel alike. The Marines secured the shore that first morning, despite encountering fierce and unexpected resistance. The Americans had strategically placed flags along the shore to establish a defensive perimeter. However, when the beach was saturated with amphibious tanks, marines and supplies, the Japanese launched a ferocious counter-attack. Their gunfire rained on the packed beach, creating a maelstrom of combat and confusion. Sergeant Thomas Alexander Baker Jr., a young private from Company A of the 105th Infantry Regiment, 27th Infantry Division, was among the first men to storm the coast. The air was tense with the salty sting of the sea and the acrid burn of gunfire, as the Marines engaged in brutal combat on the west side, Sergeant Baker's unit hit the southern end of Saipan on June 17, 1944. They clashed with the Japanese forces in a brutal welcome, the roar of arms and cries of battle filling the air. Two days later, on June 19, Baker's 105th Infantry Regiment pushed towards Nafutan Point. They hit a snag, a daunting array of Japanese pillboxes that ground their advance to a halt. Itching for action, and not one to shy away from a challenge, Private Baker took matters into his own hands. Fueled by raw determination, he grabbed a bazooka and charged ahead. The blast of the bazooka was deafening as he single-handedly took down a Japanese emplacement. He wasn't done yet. With his trusty M1 rifle, he blazed a trail for his comrades, cutting through enemy lines with relentless fire. Baker etched his name as a soldier of unparalleled boldness and selflessness, his willingness to leap into the jaws of danger, to risk it all for his brothers in arms, began to build his reputation as a soldier who didn't just toe the line of duty, but leaped over it, a true hero in the making. By the conclusion of the first day of the invasion, approximately 20,000 US troops had successfully established a beachhead on Saipan, though this came at a significant cost. As dawn broke the following day, the army sent reinforcements. Together, they began a concerted push inland, penetrating deeper into the island's territory. This invasion caught the Japanese high command off guard, as they had anticipated an attack from the south. Reacting to this unforeseen development, Admiral Shigetaro Shimada, commander-in-chief of the Imperial Japanese Navy, ordered a counter-strike against the United States Navy forces nearby. The ensuing Battle of the Philippine Sea, spanning June 19th to 20, ended in a catastrophic defeat for the Imperial Navy, which suffered the loss of three aircraft carriers and hundreds of planes, a debacle that severely diminished their aerial capabilities. General Yoshitsugu Saito, aware of the dire situation and the impossibility of resupply, recognized the futility of the defense of Saipan. Yet, in keeping with the Japanese ethos of tenacious resistance, he resolved that his forces would fight to the end. As American forces advanced through Saipan's challenging terrain, they encountered stiff resistance. Enemy fire emanating from hidden positions among the cliffs and caves inflicted heavy casualties. 
The treacherous area quickly earned grim monikers, like Death Valley or Purple Heart Ridge, due to the high number of injuries and fatalities among the advancing troops. The journey to Mount Tapuchau, a key objective, proved particularly risky for the 105th Infantry. To reach the mountain, they had to traverse the dense jungle of the valley and cross an exposed plateau. This left them dangerously vulnerable to enemy fire raining down from elevated positions, a tactical disadvantage that the Japanese defenders efficiently exploited. This phase of the battle underscored the harsh realities of warfare in such a gruelling and unforgiving landscape. Private Baker was tasked with a crucial role in rear security as his unit pressed forward, safeguarding against a potential Japanese counterattack. The bulk of the 105th had already moved past when Baker's sharp eyes caught a flicker of movement in the periphery. His Medal of Honor citation paints a vivid picture of what followed. Baker stumbled upon two enemy strongholds, each manned by Japanese officers and soldiers, overlooked in the heat of the advance. Despite being heavily outnumbered, Baker didn't flinch. He launched into an all-out assault, single-handedly eliminating every adversary. But Baker's role in this harrowing battle was far from over. Venturing further, he discovered a group of six enemy soldiers, cunningly hidden behind the lines of his comrades. In a swift, decisive action, Baker neutralized the six enemy soldiers by blindsiding them, ensuring the safety of his unit. Thanks to the path cleared by Baker and his team, the 105th Infantry Regiment successfully navigated the perilous opening. Joining forces with the 23rd Marine Regiment, they swept through the villages of Doné and Hasigoru, marking significant victories. By July 5th, the situation on Saipan had reached a critical juncture. The American forces, comprising both Marines and Army soldiers, had nearly claimed the entire island. Their iron grip left the Japanese with dwindling options, confined to the last bastion of Tanapag Plain. The American forces, entrenched and vigilant, were ready to counter any desperate attempts of escape. The Japanese forces braced themselves for one final desperate offensive, setting the stage for a climactic showdown on the embattled island. The 105th Infantry Regiment, entrenched west of Tanapag near a railroad, braced for the impending storm. On July 6th, Lieutenant General Yoshitsugu Saito, the Japanese commander, decided to launch a last ferocious Banzai charge. Over 5,000 Japanese soldiers, bayonets fixed and ready for brutal close-quarters combat, surged forward in a final offensive. Private Baker's position was besieged from three sides. Amidst the chaos, he sustained two wounds from Arisaka rifle fire, yet he never wavered. As his M1 carbine ran dry, he switched to his 45 caliber 1911 handgun and kept fighting. The situation grew dire as his fellow soldiers exhausted their ammunition. Undeterred, Baker emerged from his foxhole, transforming his carbine into a makeshift war club, swinging with primal ferocity at the encroaching enemy. After felling a dozen soldiers, Baker was struck in the stomach, the bullet leaving him grievously wounded. The defensive line crumbled, overrun by the onslaught. As his comrades attempted to evacuate him, tragedy struck again. One of them was shot. In a final act of selflessness, Baker insisted on being left behind, refusing to let his brothers-in-arms sacrifice themselves for his sake. Despite their protests, he was left propped against a tree, a 1911 handgun with just eight bullets his last line of defense. For his bravery beyond the call of duty during the Battle of Saipan, Private Baker was promoted to sergeant on May 9, 1945, and posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. It was a heroic last stand and an emblematic display of courage that many unknown soldiers also showed in the war. Admiral and Commander of the Pacific Fleet, Chester W. Nimitz, would later say that the war was a conflict in which, quote, uncommon valor was a common virtue. As the Marines valiantly seized control of Mount Tapakau, the Japanese forces were compelled to retreat northward, signifying a pivotal moment in the Battle of Saipan. The intense skirmishes, filled with the thunder of gunfire and the determination of brave hearts, led to this crucial turning point. General Saito, faced with the overwhelming might of the American forces, came to a somber resolution. In a final act of defiance, he took his own life, a stark testament to the desperation and turmoil of war. On July 9th, in a moment of solemn triumph, Admiral Turner declared Saipan officially secure. Amidst the ruins of battle, US forces raised the American flag, a symbol of hard-fought victory soaring over the battered landscape of Saipan. 
The cost of this victory was steep. The United States endured 16,525 casualties, including 3,026 brave souls lost. The Japanese suffered even more significant losses, with 29,000 fallen men. Yet this harrowing struggle yielded a strategic triumph. The first B-29 base in the Pacific, a significant leap forward in the war effort. As the Pacific War continued its relentless course, the Allies launched a bold offensive against Guam and Tinian. In a flurry of strategic maneuvers and fierce combat, they emerged victorious within weeks, securing a triumphant hold over all three islands by August. Even as the echoes of ground combat resounded, the indomitable Seabees, with skill and haste, began constructing airfields for the colossal B-29 bombers. These master builders swiftly erected five major airfields across the islands, each accommodating up to 180 warplanes. These bases marked a turning point in the war. For the first time, the Allies could launch extensive bombing raids directly on Japan. The arrival of the first B-29 bombers on Saipan on October 12, 1944, was a harbinger of this new phase of warfare. Two weeks later, the first combat mission was launched, ushering in a new era of aerial assault. On November 24, 1944, the 73rd Bomb Wing etched its name in history. With 111 B-29 bombers, they unleashed a torrent of destruction on Tokyo, the first assault on the Japanese capital since the legendary Doolittle Raid over two years prior. This momentous attack signaled a significant shift in the tide of war. With the skies over the Pacific now under Allied control, victory seemed within grasp. Reflecting on the monumental impact of these events, a Japanese admiral poignantly remarked, quote, Our war was lost with the loss of Saipan, a somber acknowledgement of a critical juncture in the war's trajectory. But not all of his men had given up the fight. Even amid utter defeat, a remarkable tale of resilience unfolded. Captain Sake Oba, a Japanese officer, along with his band of soldiers, refused to be vanquished. Outnumbered and facing a superior enemy, they retreated into the dense jungles of the island, setting the stage for an extraordinary display of resistance. Oba and his men, undeterred by their dire situation, waged a guerrilla war against the American forces. With a fierce determination, they executed hit-and-run tactics, ambushing patrols and raiding supplies. Their strategy was not just about survival, it was a calculated effort to continue the fight, to strike where least expected. Captain Ober, in his unwavering commitment, also sought to protect the innocent civilians caught in the crossfire. His leadership and strategic acumen were so effective that, on numerous occasions, his group managed to evade capture by the slimmest of margins, often hiding right above the heads of their pursuers, a testament to their stealth and ingenuity. Their resistance, lasting 16 arduous months, finally ended on December 1st, 1945. Ober and his men emerged from their jungle sanctuary, surrendering with dignity. The US Marines, recognizing Ober's tactical brilliance and elusive nature, aptly nicknamed him the Fox. The contrasting stories of Private Baker and Captain Ober, though set against immense destruction and suffering, highlight a profound truth. Amid one of the Pacific's darkest chapters, acts of bravery, honor, and resilience shone brightly, demonstrating the indomitable human spirit on both sides of the battlefront.